tell you the story, I have to start from the beginning, which is always a good place to start. Uh, <clears throat> it was 1988, and I was in my house in Lake Mills, Wisconsin, and a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. James Shares from University of Wisconsin, pulled up to my house and uh, came in, and we uh, always talk archaeology. At the time, I had a job that I cruised through Madison quite a bit, and I used to stop at UW campus and, and uh, go into the office. I had Jim's schedule, so I knew when he was free from lecturing, and <clears throat> we'd sit down and have a good talk. I really enjoyed that. It was great, great uh, learning for me. Anyway, Jim said to me, I said, uh, what do you know about the Michigan tablets? This is 1988. And I said, I don't know anything about the Michigan tablets. I don't know what they are. And uh, he pulled out a bunch of photographs and showed them to me. And uh, I'm going to show you a few of those in a minute. Let's get started. And when I saw all these, I was, boy, I was... I was pretty excited. They looked pretty good. And I said, so what's the scope? And he said, well, an estimated between 10,000, possibly even high as 30,000, these came out of the state of Michigan and on the fringe of Wisconsin, Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois. And I said, really? I said, how come we don't know about it? He said, well, they've been kind of shuffled under the rug. Uh, they've got a bad name. Uh, they're considered highly controversial. And uh, this is basically the academia has pushed them aside and said that they're probably all bogus. And uh, because of the content uh, of some of them, but primarily because it showed contact with the Middle Eastern culture. And of course, what's taught in our schools, as you're all well aware, nobody here before Christopher Columbus. So right away, it flew in the face of academia that someone was here from the Mediterranean, because that means they would have maritime technology, and that wasn't accepted at it either that uh, we could sail the ocean blue. We'd go around the edges, like around Africa, the Egyptians, and maybe into Australia, but not, not cross the Atlantic, or the Pacific. That was a big no-no in academia. And Powell, John Wesley Powell, and Henry Morgan really set the temper for that, which really is with us today. Um, they're really holding fast that the people here are a Stone Age culture. And uh, that's something I definitely, definitely do not agree with. But anyway, it goes on, it persists. So what I'm gonna do is just show you a few things here. And Dr. Shares told me, he says, yeah, he said, the, the biggest collection of these Michigan artifacts is in your church. And I said, what? He said, yeah, he said, they're in your church. And I thought, well, what, why aren't they showing them? And he said, well, it's because they're considered controversial, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, he said, I want, you to, uh, I want you to go after them. And so that began a really a lifelong pursuit for me to really follow up and find out what is all about the Michigan artifacts. Even though I have a lot of information, I don't have the whole story. I have a piece of the story. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. So uh, having said that, uh, Henriette Metz, she's really the, uh, the hero in this here. She managed to study uh, the plates for quite a long time. And we'll get to her just in a minute, but. This is the main thing that really pops up on most of the artifacts. And she coined this as the mystic symbol or mark of the Michigan Mound Builders. Henrietta put that together. And uh, she put a book together, but she died before it got printed. And it was printed seven years later by her nephew, uh, Herbert Mertz, who I guess was heir to all her worldly <coughs> possessions, which included the book. The book that went out, they only put out 200 copies. I have two first editions. One of them I had to use to reprint this book. And eventually, I bought the uh, copyright from the Mertz family. And now I keep this book alive in Ancient American, and I have it going on continuously available. And uh, actually, we've sold thousands through Barnes & Noble and just through the pages of Ancient American. So, And I did bring a few along to put out at Mackley's place, and I'm going to offer them to you guys at cost. So if you want to get the story, this is you really need to read Henriette's book. Now, I ran with this guy, and I'm not going to tell you the university. It's in Michigan because he's a good guy. He's still working for me. He told me flat out, he says, this is the picture that was taken in his university, and these, were, these artifacts belong to the university, but they don't know where they are. <laughs> they can't find them. And I have no reason not to believe him, but they're missing. And so even to this day, he is still looking. I call him about once every 12 months. Any luck? <laughs> and it's always a resounding no. So, uh, you know, there's a good chance they were probably thrown out in the local dump. 
because by 1920s in that area, this thing was such a hot topic. They were so badly ripped on in the local papers. Many, many collections throughout Michigan in particular, small collections, 10, 15, 20 pieces, whatever, people threw these things away in wholesale to the dump. They just pitched them. So we're lucky to have what we have. Milner Hunter was very fortunate in the 1970s, two LDS missionaries working in Indiana at Elkhart at Notre Dame knocked on the door of a Catholic priest, and the priest happened to be a curator of their artifacts. And he says, I've got some stuff that I think your church should really look at. And so he took the two guys into the, into the room to see these things. He showed them Michigan plates. Uh, they right away got a hold of Milton or Hunter, who they knew was involved heavily in archeology span for the church. Uh, Milton arranged uh, with Notre Dame to acquire, and they actually gave them to him. He paid for the shipment. Uh, the bad part is they were packed poorly in cracker barrels, and a lot of the clay pieces, when they arrived in Salt Lake City by train, were broken inside the barrels. But uh, overall, Milton ended up with about 900 pieces. And I'm just going to show you a few. These are his photographs that he took when he got them. I just want you to see them real quick, kind of get used to them. Again, notice here, here's our mystic symbol. This is a 13-month calendar, which is typical of the Mediterranean cultures. and. Uh, uh, this uh, probably look, maybe half a shoe box in size. And I really, I'm pretty sure it's an ossuary box where you know, a person be cremated, and this all his ashes then will be put in here for uh, safekeeping, burial, or whatever you want to do. And uh, here's a couple more. We're going to see a lot of this up here, and I'll explain that in the coming upcoming slides. This is son of the left hand, son of the right hand, and uh, this is God the Father. And we got a confrontation going on here. We got. Guys dressed up here in perhaps a military uniform. We got naked guys over here with feathers in their hair, or else they're the first punk rockers. I'm not sure, but their hair is quite, quite formidably up in the air. And uh, you can see they've had a fight. There's, there's dead guys here. Again, we got another calendar. And this one over here, I really can't say much about it. This is typical Michigan script. And of course, this has all been considered, uh, you know, bogus. And Henry and Mertz in her book. Um, she was an epigrapher, and she worked for the U.S. government during World War II to decipher and break languages. And in her book, if you read it, you'll find out she says, no two people made these plates. Every plate has its own signature. And she can even tell if the guy was left-handed or right-handed by the stroke and the characters, the way they're gouged out. So if you read her book, you'll really get pulled in. And again, some look extremely elementary, like this one. And on the right there, it looks uh, a lot more, uh, you know, nicely done. But if they're made by a large body of people, they don't all have to be works of art. But here we go. Mystic symbol, mystic symbol. These are Milton's plates in here. Now, this next one I'm going to show you, th this is one of the things that really caused a big knockout amongst academics because this really shows not only contact with the Mediterranean, but it shows there is a Christian presence. And that was just too much. <laughs> I couldn't handle it. Over here, you have spiritual creation. Yod Heva, man's on his back, maybe like he's dormant. Here's the, the birds, quadrupeds, fishes in the water. Here's the uh, eye of God, the rays coming down. Uh, this right here represents, I believe, a heavenly family. And then over here is physical or temporal creation. Here's uh, Jehovah. Notice the lines coming out from his mouth. By the words of his mouth, everything created, John 1 and 3, all things were made by him, without him was not anything made that was made. Very, very Christian oriented. But these things were looked upon as uh, extremely troublesome. And I just, just really, really cool stuff. Here's a, th these pieces I'm going to show you right now real quickly are Henry de Mertz's collection. Uh, I have her collection, and some of her pieces are up front here. You can look at them later. Uh, just want to show them to you. You all recognize this from the story of Moses, yes? Yes? Okay, pretty nice. And that's the backside, obverse, reverse. Another calendar plate, again, mystic symbol. 13 month calendar, very nicely done. Another one there, you got Sphinx, Michigan script. Guys here making some brew. Might be good grape juice, who knows? I doubt it. 
And uh, again, just, you know, this is, these are the Michigan plates. These are the tablets. And nice little shuttle here. What would that be used for? I have no idea. That's a shuttle. They call it a shuttle. Uh, I mean, shuttle. 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 S-H-U-T-T-E-L is what Henry calls it, so I don't know. Is that Zephyr for? Use that for weaving. For weaving. Would you wrap, uh, wrap okay. the stuff on the inside and throw it across? No, I can the see what you're saying. And she, she, she purely, she called it a shuttle. Henry called it a shuttle. Now, is that stone? Yeah, so black slate. This is black slate. And then we have, uh, oh, there's elephants. Now we're really in trouble. Okay, bad, bad deal. Some kind of a funeral procession going. Yes, Mallory. I'd say, I'd say it's made to be attached to a, you know, a post or a, a, a wall, a door. It's, it's not to be worn. They're too heavy. So, I don't know. What do you want to call it? Do you know where they got the slate from? I do. Barriga, Michigan is where the slate comes from. I've been there. And again, I showed this one before and then here. Um, this one here, I think, could possibly, possibly be the Tower of Babel. Um, if you look up here at the top, we've got, this is son of the right hand, which I'll explain that in a minute. But he's over, I think this is rainbows. After the flood, here's son of the left hand's mark. And what do we have here? Water. Son of the left hand's in charge of the, the drowning. <laughs> the rainbow, or the covenant with God, is son of the right hand. So things are going to be good. This is the Tower of People here are getting pushed off. And down here, the bird, the bird shows up a lot. And I think the bird, for me, represents the Holy Ghost. And there's lines coming out of his mouth. And these people here are all receiving the words from the bird. Uh, this is clay. This one is a clay tablet. Now, we've had some things with the clay. Uh, some of the clay was tested. And uh, the clay pieces did dissolve. Uh, the, I have clay tablets. I've got four of them. And I've got some broken pieces like that as well in the corners. And I have soaked mine for six months and my clay has not dissolved, which means this has been baked. Of course, the charge being the other ones were fake because they were made and therefore they wouldn't hold up, that they were modern. And maybe they were. Uh, when you get something 10 and 30,000 in size, you're gonna have some fakes. You're gonna have some fakes. It's just the way it is. And we're gonna get to that. And then I wanna show you, we do have lots in private collections. Uh, this one here, uh, David here, makes replicas and he's brought one of these to show right david okay. and this, this is boy if i could have any i would go get this piece tomorrow the guy called me and said come get it i would i would be gone i wouldn't be here tomorrow morning i'd be gone <laughs> this thing is so awesome it's got copper on the corners uh, it's it just it's just beautiful i mean it's just beautiful it comes apart it's got copper it just <laughs> it's just it's incredible and then we got something like this i have no idea what it's for and here's some type of, do I dare call it a sundial? I don't know. Uh, David's made this as a, as a replica. He's got these available also. Do you really want to show, David? Yes. Good. Got, you'll be able to see one of these tomorrow at Macri's house. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, this here is a, a flood, flood scene. We've got, uh, we've got four men here, Noah, Shem, Japheth, and Ham. And here we got four ladies. And we're going to get on the boat. Of course, the floods already happened. Here's the covenant with God, the rainbow, and the waters are back to normal. And here's Noah again here, no doubt, talking about whatever is going on, mystic symbol. These are all private. This is all privately owned pieces. I like the ones that show clothing. Uh, Give some idea how these people dress. And we've got copper pieces, possibly some coinage. Don't know for sure. And this guy here, beautifully done. I don't know what it's for. I, uh, Get hold your uh, change at night before you go to bed. Put your loose coin in. You know, I, I have no idea what it's for. Uh, very nicely done. Very nicely done. And we got, we do have some tools like this for working. And another garden scene. This looks like Adam, serpent. Obviously, they're having a conversation, which we don't, we don't know what it says. Now, with the mystic symbol up here, Henriette and David Deal would come along and they were working on it. And then of course, Henry had died. Uh, I was with David for about, you know, I had David for about 10 years. He's been gone now for about eight years. I really miss him. And uh, 
what I have learned, I've acquired from David, David from Henrietta, and so on and so forth. So, um, 1994, I'm in Golden Valley, Minnesota. One of my subscribers was in charge of a men's glee club. They invited me over to, uh, this guy, he, he saw the stuff in the magazine. He said, come over and show us some mystic art artifacts, some Michigan stuff. So I said, sure. So I come over, and uh, I go through about 200 slides, just like I did with you guys just now. Just looking at all this neat stuff, and we'd stop and we'd talk about it, and it was fun. But when I finished, <clears throat> I got done, a Native American walked up. I mean, I had a poster up on the wall behind me, and he pointed up to the mystic symbol here, and he said, that's our stuff. And I'm looking at this guy, he was, this guy was big, he was about 6'3". <clears throat> and I thought, boy, I did something wrong, he's going to get mad at me. And he said, I said, well, what is this? And he says, this is the name of Creator. And I said, can you make the sound? He said, I can. He said, it's yod he va yod he va And I said, well, that sounds a lot like Jehovah. And he says, well, he said, that's what it is, it's Creator. And uh, we, uh, we use this mark in our ceremonies today because I'm a medicine man out of uh, northern Wisconsin. And uh, he's a Jibwa. And uh, he put this on to me. So right away when I got home, I sent off the symbol to an epigrapher that I knew in Utah. And I sent one to an epigrapher that I knew in Massachusetts. Massachusetts guy was not a member of the LDS church. And they both came back with this mark and told me this was indeed a yod hey va Carl Beza is the one that gave it to me out of there. And then I got this out of uh, <clears throat> the Keys of Enoch book. A Hebrew tetragrammaton, the Father's sacred name, three sacred letters, the yod, the hey, and the va. yod hey va Now the full name of God is yod hey va hey And we'll get to that in a little bit. This is Henrietta's book. That's what the cover looks like. I have going. So here we are. We got mystic symbol, Mark of the Michigan Bow Builders, deity or God, son of the right hand, it can stand for that alone, and God and son together at the same time. And uh, here's David Deal um, with the whole pronunciation of God. Yod, hey, va, hey. Remember, it's right to left. Right to left. So it's not hey, va, hey, yod. <laughs> All right? Right to left. That's the way it is. That's David right there. Okay? So, David was the first one that picked up on something that was very, very unique to the LDS faith. He found out in the Epistle of Sophia during the Nicaea Creed between the 3rd and 4th century, and that was being decided which books of Scripture are going to make up our holy record, our Bible. At the time, many of the sects there believed in a good son and a bad son. And at this time, the, those in charge decided that that was blasphemy, that Heavenly Father could not have a bad son. And they struck that out of the record. And then anybody that would teach or practice that could face burning at the stake. It was that serious. It was kept alive by the Egyptian cops. Otherwise, all this was gone about a good son and a bad son. I mean, it was gone. And what happens to us, of course, the restoration of the gospel in our day, what do we have? We've got the whole story of the good son and bad son. So here's something no one would have known about, you know, in backwoods Michigan to pound this out. That's my point. So there it is. At the level just beneath the Holy Father are two subordinate beings, both sons, both deities, one good, one bad. And these are the signs. Son of the right hand, son of the left hand. The one called the lesser, the little Sabaoth of the good, son of the right hand, this is Sophia Book 2, Chapter 63. There's your reference. Excuse me. And the other deity, the devil, Shemaliel, Evil, son of the left hand, and all the way down. And this is where you find all this stuff. It's out there in this book by the cops. <coughs> so I'm going to show you this real quick. This one is a good way to demonstrate it. Um, um, this is the, the whole thing. It's really big, but I'm going to blow this up to you and do one of these sections at a time so you can see it better. We're going to start at the top left corner, and we're going to go through each, each individual picture. Okay, you ready? We're going to start at the top left. Yod, hey, va. Here's the top one. Here we see creator, yod, hey, va, and he's creating Adam in the Garden of Eden, creation tablet. And we've got angelic beings looking on. 
And then we have over here, son of the right hand's mark. Again, creator's taking, putting, bringing Eve to life, and Adam standing here in the background. Notice we have a waterfalls, like in the Garden of Eden in the background. And he's now, got a smile. Uh, no, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> why, why is Adam smiling? Why is this a woman? How do you know it's a woman? Well, obviously, really, but because Adam, Adam is smiling. That's definitely a fact. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty. There's always somebody in the crowd who picks that out. Yeah, always somebody. So that's all right. That's all right. Oh, so here they are eating the uh, forbidden fruit, son of the left hand. You know, not good. Here's son of the right, uh, left hand again, getting ex kicked out of the garden by Heavenly Father. That's Cain is killing Abel. And we have to assume this is Abel because he has the shepherd's crook. Okay? And here's um, Abraham, son of the right hand. Got your goat caught in the thicket. And uh, here's the second plate. Again, I showed this before. Up on top, son of the right hand, son of the left hand. There's been a confrontation. Again, the 13-month calendar. And there's a nice close-up. So this, this good son, bad son, exists nowhere else in Christendom except with the cops and Mormons. Nobody else has got it. Nobody. And the mound builders. And the mound builders. <clears throat> there you go. Okay. Milton R. Hunter did not live very long once he got a hold of the tablets. When he died in his will, he willed everything to the Museum of Church, Art, and History. And I didn't know why until I got to meet the curator much later on. And he told me about the will and its existence. And the will stated that the plates, the Michigan relics, were never to leave the city limits of Salt Lake City. They weren't to leave. And, you know, and the, the anthropology department at the Y wanted the whole collection to come down, and they wouldn't ship it. And there wasn't a whole lot of interaction. There was some. But uh, so they stayed put. For some reason, Milton didn't want them to go to BYU at the, at the anthropology department. So there was some friction there, and I don't know what it is. But these guys here are only concerned with the beginning of the church in 1830. And so to house this collection for them was a waste of space, and it was something they really didn't want to do. They only wanted 1830 and forward. That's all they wanted. But Milton gave it to them. So. You can ponder on that. So in spring of 96, after taking me, it took me, well, let's see, 88, uh, we're talking, uh, what, two, eight years. It took me eight years to finally get into the warehouse because I was hitting the wrong people to hit the right button, you know, to get into the warehouse. <laughs> anyway, I finally got in. This is Dr. Glenn Leonard, really a nice guy, fine, fine man. This is Michael Smith, uh, his second in command. And these are the racks. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven racks. They're four feet across, and they're eight feet and eight feet, so they're 16 feet long. And that housed all the Michigan relics that they had in storage. And uh, the bad thing is that the plates were sat, sitting down there, and they were stacked up two on top, one on top of the other, and they were getting scratched, and they weren't really taken care of. But again, they didn't want them, but they took them because they were willed by, by Milton. So um, when I went in and talked to Brother Leonard, he asked me a very unusual question. He said, <laughs> he said, Brother May, he said, how did you know that these artifacts were here in this warehouse? At first I thought, that's kind of a funny question. And then I realized, I said, the answer was, in my mind, I told him straight out, I said, the only people that don't know these artifacts are here are members of this church. <laughs> people in the Midwest are thinking we're hiding something because they're not on display. I said, Glenn, I said, put them on display. Do something. Show them. Let people see them. And this controversy will go away. Just, just put them out there. Well, unfortunately, that didn't happen. The controversy kept growing and growing and growing, of course, until finally they, they got shipped, and we'll get that in a minute. This is, uh, this is Jim Shares, my good friend. This is Milner Hunter's daughter. And uh, again, this is Glenn. A couple of this is, um, oh gee, I haven't said his name in years. Uh, I'll think about it in a minute. But it's him and his son. 
And uh, again, just showing some shots here of the, of the racks. Is that this is all copper here. All copper. Swords, right? Oh, yeah. It was a jet guard. Yeah, look at the pipes. There must be, there had to be at least 50 pipes. All beautifully carved. I mean, they're really cool pipes. Uh, I'd be tempted to smoke if I had one, but anyway, there they are. So, uh, oh, oh, you mean these curved guys? Oh, yeah. Well, here's curved. Look back here. Aren't those mentioned in the Book of Mormon? Oh, yeah, the cemeteries. Yeah. Yeah, in my, in my regular Hopewell presentation, I've got a better picture of a nice cemetery and straight swords at 54 inches long, all, all from Wisconsin, Minnesota. Guys, the swords are out here, okay? You just haven't all seen them, okay? But they're there, we got is, it. Is this hard, copper, is that it? This is all hard, yeah, you don't wanna get hit by this, okay? <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I have to work on Brian Nettles on this one. He tells me this one here, he thinks this one's bogus, which it could be, but it happens to be my favorite piece, doggone it. It's, a, it's red slate. It's beautifully done. I mean, I love this piece. Matter of fact, I told Glenn Leonard, I, I picked out five pieces. I said, at this time, they, they were slated to go to Michigan to be given back. And I said, please, here's five pieces. I pointed them out, and this was one of them. I said, please don't send this back. Put it in the church archives, hang on to it, keep it. Because <laughs> it's my favorite piece. And you know what? Ryan Fisher, my tour guide partner, uh, he got in over there and he saw, he said he saw everything. Well, if, if that's the case, if he really did see everything, this piece is not there. So they kept a few back, but I, I can't verify that. But that has not been seen since here in the warehouse. And uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So, uh, and again, these are the guys, I brought, I brought in probably over 100 uh, people, usually about 10 or 15 at a time to come in and see the stuff. I want to be, and, and I brought in guys from the Midwest so they knew that I wasn't crazy back here, you know? The stuff does exist. Uh, it's really that deep. And I brought in a lot of members of the church that lived in the valley in Salt Lake and took pictures of everything. And uh, they got to see them, you know, before they, before they got shipped out. And uh, it, it was fun. Front and back on this right here is a creation scene. Start front and back. Yes, turn it over, front and back. And these things are so heavy. Some of them, they said they were used as shingles for shingling uh, Pioneer Log Cabins. Oh. And I said, man, if you put this on a log cabin, I, I don't think four or five of these, your cabin's going to collapse. I mean, they, they, they didn't have any way to support. This is weight. This stuff's, some of these plates are like almost a half inch thick. Wait, how tall is that? Uh, this is really close to four feet. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's quite, very nicely done. I mean, I wish I had better photos of it. Uh, time was limited. This is uh, uh, Jeff Garf and, and Ron Garf. They did a lot of work on them. Uh, he made a couple of uh, VHSs on, on the work here. And again, here you can see the racks back here, top to bottom. Uh, this is Dr. Shares again, and Gary Taylor here, Milton's uh, daughter. And here, here I am with uh, Milton's daughter. No great. Who's the young guy? Uh, it's my brother. Uh, he's not around right now. I know. Uh, he, he's, he's inactive. He wins <laughs> so anyway, fall of 04, um, I hired a, a church attorney. Uh, he went in to see Leonard, and we, we did everything we could to stop the shipment going back to Michigan, but it wasn't enough. We had to have a place for him to go in the, the state of Utah, and we just didn't, couldn't find a place that could house him. And uh, so we were considered, I don't know how serious of a consideration it was, but we were considered, but uh, we, we fell short. And so everything went back. And I was excited when they first went back because I thought, terrific. Now, the state of Michigan, uh, Dr. Halsey, who I knew who he was, hopefully he's gonna put at least half of them maybe on display. And the people, as you guys travel, you can go back there and see, because in Salt Lake, you can't see them, okay? So I was excited about that. So in this magazine, right here, this is one. Of, this is my actual issue. I wrote back, Michigan's controversial tablets go home. And then I, and down here in the yellow. In any case, we are grateful to the state of Michigan and Dr. John Halsey for preserving them and making them available once again to the general public. Because I talked to John, he said, yeah, we're gonna put them on display. That's all he said. Wonderful. Well, about four magazines later, he put his response out. 
And I gotta tell you, it wasn't nice. And I got thoroughly ticked off. You can read here. All demonstrably modern fakes. What's so special? First relics were discovered in Moncom, Michigan, 1890. I'll tell you right now, folks, that is a bold-faced lie. And I'm going to prove it to you today. 1890. And these guys, they have stuck with that date. The archaeologists of Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. And, and my friend, Dr. Shears, we call, it, we call it the Michigan cartel. These guys hate the Michigan artifacts. And we have been fighting these guys since the 80s. And Jim started in the 70s. And we're just telling it the way it is, OK? Now, I'll tell you how bad it is in a minute. Anyway, they're talking about 1890, the sign painter Scottford consisted mostly of burned, crudely modeled clay boxes. Well, that's not true. There was more black slate than clay. But it was just one thing after another. And so when he put them on display in Michigan, he put them on display for about four months, maybe five. And this is his actual sign that went up. And notice at the top, 1890, Scotford discovers the clay cup. And for him, that is the start to 1919, and that tells the entire story of the Michigan artifact. I'm here to tell you, folks, it just isn't so. And I'm going to show it. I'm going to prove it to you. Where, where did they come up with the 1890? How did that happen? That's when, they, that's when Scotford dug up the clay cup. Uh, okay, now look at this. Book of Mormon Central, BYU studies, stepped right in with the state of Michigan making these claims. Spent 30 years planning fake artifacts. Scottford's now run around Michigan planning artifacts for 30 years. <laughs> Think about it, 10 to 30,000 pieces. Artifacts were produced, buried, discovered, and marketed by the Scottfords. Right there, 1890 and 1919. Walking in lockstep, both groups with state of Michigan, it's absolutely disgusting. Here is Dorothy Hayden and Lois Benedict. They worked on the plates way before Deal got involved and way before I got involved. These are the counties that they had positive identification where artifacts were found. So now think of the Scottfords. They're running around burying 10,000 plus artifacts before 1890, right? That's the claim. And they're gonna go dig them all up. That's the claim. And they're gonna sell them all. Let's just go on. The question is, what happened to these years, which I'm going to show you? 1812, 46, 56, the 60s and the 70s, all ignored completely by Dr. Halsey. I mean completely. He said the Scottfords did all the digging. Well, check out this picture right here. This guy is Charles Allen. He dug up the plates here. This is Father Savage. This is Senator Soper. There's no Scottford here. Where's the Scottford name? Doesn't exist. And he's not alone. There was many. Campbell's Flood, 1856. We've got Michigan artifacts coming off the St. Lawrence in Canada. I've never even seen them. I called the curator up here in Toronto. I couldn't even get in because I'm not a PhD. She told me straight up, can't see them. They're fake anyway. Why do you want to do it? I mean, a terrible treatment. I couldn't even get in. I couldn't even get in. 1856, that's his tablet he worked on. It's a flood tablet. And I like this one here, too. Publication called Relics of the American Mound Builders by John Campbell, professor of the Presbyterian College of Montreal. The book describes his analysis of some Michigan artifacts, including a deluge tablet with similar script as the Michigan artifacts. He compares the language to a stone found on Monhegan Island off the coast of Maine. The stone is covered on both sides with the same cuneiform looking language of the Michigan artifacts along with the mystic symbol. The Monhegan Island stone is documented as being first studied in 1856, roughly 34 years before the 1890 Soper Savage items started to appear. I view this information as monumental for the veracity of the Michigan artifacts reference noted. Mouth of the St. Lawrence, just south of there you'll find Monhegan Island and you'll find this. And why would that be there? Because it's a billboard to those who are coming across the Atlantic Ocean. This is where we are. This is where you turn in. This is our tributary. Come in here and you will find us. These are signs. Look at this one. Hamlin, next guy. 
His find was preceded by the first ever reference to an engraved example of the mysterious script in 1898 by A. Cameron, president of the Summer School of Science for the Atlantic Provinces of Canada. That stone also on Monhegan Island has been known since 1812. The upper line of the inscription found in 1856 is the same as the old one. The 1856 inscription near the shore lay about one mile southwest of where the first one was found in 1812. Both have since been lost, although at least a faithful copy of the 1856 inscription was published and reference given. And we're looking at 78 years. 78 years before the Scotford showed up. Why didn't Dr. Halsey talk about this? That's my question. He has no answer. He has no answer. Worth. We don't know. He was a traveling tinker, a handyman. We're not sure what he did, but he was all over Michigan. And by 1860, when the Civil War broke out, he's in New York City with a horse and pony show showing Michigan artifacts to make a living. People get in his wagon, walk through, see the Michigan artifacts. I don't know what they paid him. You know, two pennies, nickel, dime, whatever. And then he ends up moving out there. He built his own museum. And unfortunately, it caught fire, and everything was destroyed except for about five pieces, which were recovered eventually by Philip Schuff of Chicago. Now, this is where Henrietta comes in. He was a judge. He knew about Henrietta's credentials. He hired her. He said, I really like these things, but I got to know if they're fake or are they real. And he hired Henrietta and gave her the task. And the result of her book is her work to show Shup. And at the end of her book, she will tell you straight out, she was convinced that these things were authentic. Not without some dabbling, but they are authentic. State of Michigan, every state usually puts out an almanac at the end of the year, you know, boasting about their state, what they do, gross revenue sales, our industry, and look down here, 1869. They make a bold statement, the Michigan relatives are here, mentioned 1869. Well, that's not 1890, that's 1869. How did Halsey miss this? I, I don't know. American Antiquarian in the Oriental Journal, this is the place for archeologists of the day. I would even go here way before I go to the Smithsonian to find out my reference material. Dr. Kelsey has declared everything fake. Now this is Stephen Peake talking here, the editor. Highly respected. Peake says, long before the first date mentioned by Professor Kelsey, we, the editors, knew the existence of and examined personally many of the same kind of finds that is mentioned in the above articles in 1871. We visited Mr. Franklin of Crystal, Michigan. This man had for years been a collector and his collection was so large that a special building had been erected to house it. Slate tablets of the flood, axes, knives, spearheads, copper coins, caskets, incense burners, pipes, figurines, idols, all marked with a cuneiform script, mystic symbol. What do you think, people? What do you think? And then this guy here, Pete just makes a comment in 1885, this guy finds a box of tools, they're building a, a new uh, lighthouse for the United States up on the lake, and he found all these hardened copper tools, and he talks about the big saw that was 20 inches long, and all, everything else. All these tools are found in a great big wooden box when they broke ground to build this tower. Stuff just popping up all over the place. And here's a saw. Glad you want to see it. See the handle grip on the end? Hardened copper saws. Can any uniform script? In Michigan, any other uniform find? Yeah. We got it coming out of Ohio. This was declared to be authentic by Cornell University out of New York. Professor David Owen did the work on it. 2000 BC. What in the world is this doing in Wisconsin? I should say, excuse me, in, in um, the East. The point is, of Ohio, the point is to dissuade you of this, the claim is that this guy went on a trip to the Middle East, and when he went hunting, this was his good luck charm. It's in his pocket. His pocket had a hole in it, and he lost it while he was hunting. <laughs> and this guy found it, and therefore, it's, it really is just, it's real, but it, was lost. That's how it got here. That's what we run into. I'm telling you, this is, it's, the, it's the gospel truth. And then we have Chief Joseph. He gets arrested in 1877 in Montana. He has a bag around his medicine bag around his chest, which is normal. They take it away from him, and inside is this cuneiform tablet. And they ask him, what's that? 
The chief said the tablet had been passed down in his family for many generations that they had inherited from their white ancestors. Chief Joseph said that the white men had come among his ancestors a long time ago. You want to go see this? It's at West Point. It's on display. Go to West Point. You can see it. And then Mrs. Hearn in Georgia, she's digging in her garden, and she kicks up this one right here. Another one. Now here's the funny part. The middle one, the top one here, Professor Biggs found that it was a sales receipt for a lamb dating back to 2042 B.C. Hmm. Interesting. Isn't that weird? Now look at the one down below. It recorded the sale of sheep and goats, which apparently had been transported overseas to America. Whoa. That's the fusion. Yet there it is. Talking about it. Crazy. He's just off the wall. And then Tim's Hill, Brantwood. Now, all you guys that live out west, you can't laugh about this. But 1,900 feet, that's the highest elevation in Wisconsin. Okay? So, if the water goes up too much in Lake Michigan, we'll lose about two-thirds of Wisconsin. And uh, I live in this one-third, so I'm okay. I'll still be here. At Brantwood, Wisconsin, we've got a standing stone, six feet high. Native Americans used to gather here for centuries. Sons for daughters, daughters for sons, and trade goods back and forth. And when they would come, they would bring a stone from their homeland, and they'd pile the stones around the base of the, of the menhir. If you want to talk about archaeology language, the standing stone, the menhir, okay? We had one of these exact same things without the standing stone. Where? Middle ground. Where was it? Independence on the Temple lot. Independence, Missouri, Temple lot. This exact same thing except for the Standing Stone. And I'm not going to get into that. But anyway, we're at this place here. I'm with Dr. Shares. I got Merlin Red Cloud, who's a good friend of ours. He's Winnebago. And so Jim, he lines up. Yep, he says the thing's on. It, it, it's got good, good, good marks. So we knew the field to the east was gone. The field to the south had been cleared. So. Shara sent me into the north, and he sent, we sent Merlin into the west to see if anything was out there. And sure enough, I got out there into the north, and I find two huge stones, and they're directly in line, so it's an altar. They had some kind of a ceremony going on here. And Merlin, he starts hollering from the west side, come quick, come quick. And so Jim and I run in there, we find 30 stones around the stone altar. They'd scratched in the mystic symbol. Now this is recent, this isn't old, which means the Native Americans are still coming there and performing some kind of ceremony at these locations. At some designated time, we don't know when it is. And I threw down that dollar for just for, for scale, so you could see it, okay? This guy here, Jim Guthrie, he tried to get a, well we're going to attempt to begin this next few days getting epigraphers together to start working on the Michigan script and see if we can get some commonality and make some headway. Unfortunately, it never got off the ground. But Jim is a legitimate scientist. He's an academic, a lot of credentials, and he believed at least 80 to 70 percent of the artifacts from Michigan were legitimate. There is some bad ones. There's some junk. But again, if you lay them all on the table, we're going to be able to pick them out. But we've got to see them all, whatever's left. We gotta lay them out, lay them together, and pick out the bad ones, save the good ones. And unfortunately, it didn't get off the ground, but uh, hopefully, maybe starting this week, we can reestablish that and uh, make some headway. Testimony. Testimonies are important. And we got a really good one here for the Scottfords. Scottfords did not get along with his daughter. His daughter signed an affidavit that she saw her dad making some of these artifacts. And my testimony, my understanding, we probably mostly made out of clay. The clay ones, because of the ones that fell apart in water. He testified that he had made some. She witnessed this event. She signed it. This is the affidavit. So the point is, starting in 1890, what happened to everything from 89 and back? You understand? We're only talking 1890 and forward. So we're leaving out over two-thirds of what's going on. But we have testimonies also during the same time period. September of 1911, right here. This guy here, whoops, back up, right here. We excavated this spot at a depth of about 
Two feet found in numbers one, two, three, and four. Later, under similar conditions, and on the area of an acre found five and ten rods distant, we verily believe these were deposited by a prehistoric people, planting for fraud, altogether unlikely. And the people on here, there's no Father Savage, there's no Soper, and the Scotfords are not present. It's totally separate, private. This is not the Scotford people at all, yet it's in the same timeline, 1911. These are what they found, and here's one too here. Found smaller one where I had Emily thrown it out of the mark in Michigan tablet. Here's again the names. These people put their names on these and published these records. Testimonies. We got testimonies of the dad making stuff. We got testimonies of other people. No connection to Soper, no connection to Scottford or Savage, and they found stuff without those guys at all. So, you know, tit for tat, right? I think so. And then, of course, again, just to highlight this, again, BYU spent 30 years planning fake artifacts, artifacts produced, buried, discovered, and marketed all by the Scottfords. When the first ones came out in 1812, like 1840s, the Scottfords weren't even born. But we got Michigan artifacts bounced around, okay? So, yod heh -Vah, mystic symbol, tetragrammaton, Hebrew sacred name, yod heh -Vah. This is the area we find them. Michigan is the heaviest. We find a sprinkling all over. We got one out in Utah that I found on a private ranch. That goes out to Monhegan Island. And we got them coming out of the south out of the Burroughs Cave, which has not been confirmed yet, but we're working on it. And, uh, but again, Michigan is, is the location. And uh, that's my choice for land bountiful, by the way. Now, for those who say that the Yod Heva is a bunch of bunk, this right here is the Catholic Church. Basilica of St. Louis, Missouri, Yod Heva, and there it is, right above their doorway. Imagine that. I got to tell you guys, if you start looking around the Midwest, you're going to see this all over on Christian churches, but we're not looking, we're not looking. This is just a little teeny church in Iowa, Episcopal Church. Okay. This is, this is a real killer. St. Paul's Cathedral, New York City. This is where George Washington went to church. And many, many of our leaders have been there ever since. And I'm going to show you what's inside. Now, I'm going to run out a bunch of photos, and then we'll connect them. These are the hot spots. Okay, ready? Incense burn on a table buried in sand. This is a Christian church. Tablets from Mount Sinai, Moses. Sunburst, the Yod Heva He. And then the All Seeing Eye up on top, Yod Heva He. This is St. Paul's Cathedral in New York City. Still in use today by a good Christian group. It's all this Hebrew stuff. And then down here, a full Torah is set inside. A full Torah. Judeo Christianity. At its best. I, I don't know what to say, but there it is. Isn't that wild? Okay, final remarks. This is my Michigan Relics timeline. This is what blows me away. 1812 to 1889, Dr. Halsey says he has no knowledge of anything before 1890. And I, what I've dug out, it just took me a couple weeks, and I'm sure there's more. I didn't want to find any more. I don't need any more. 77 years, public record. It's in the public record. Anybody can find it. 19 years over there. So he's chucked the entire Michigan collection based on 19 years and skipped everything here. You understand? This has all been skipped, ignored, passed over. I can only say one thing. It's a deliberate cover-up. I don't know what else to say. It's really sad that we have to treat this stuff this way. Yeah, there's fakes in here, but let's lay them out on the table, let's sort them out, and we'll find the real ones from the bad ones. That's what I think. Now, here's logistics that you needed if Scottfords had done this, okay? Cross Lake Huron, because the slate is from Barriga, that's where the mine is. Copper is from the Keweenaw, so they gotta go up and mine all the copper. Cross Lake, Michigan also constructs burials in mounds of 27 counties. 
manufacture 10,000 plus artifacts, clay, slate, copper, with accuracy, find human bones to accompany some of the burials, they're not all cremations, some poor fellows. <laughs> Fakers must know at least three ancient scripts, hieroglyphics, Assyrian, and cuneiform, because there's a mixture. They can't just put out mumbo jumbo marks, they gotta be the real characters if you're gonna pull it off. Create mounds without being seen before 1846. Avoid being killed by Native Americans. They're here so early, the Indians here are pretty hostile yet. All right? Avoid multiple testimonials from many settlers who are digging up artifacts. Oh, you didn't find that? No, just forget that. Put it back. Ignore Native American oral history. Well, that's not going to go over good. Inform Native Americans they are wrong about their history. Uphold a paradigm, no contact across the ocean until 1492. And ancients had no maritime technology. This is what they would have to do to make all that stuff legit. I mean, it's crazy, just crazy. So that my question to you is, what does it take to make a good replica? What does it take? It takes one good, authentic artifact, and then you can make your copies. The Michigan tablets, in my estimation, are as real as we are sitting here. There are bad ones. Scotford's did make some junk but we can find them if we could put them all in one spot and set some of you guys in a pigrapher on them and go after them. So, as always, I report, you decide.